take some questions I, I, as I consider mine. Hi, Anton. Hi. Uh, thank you for um, making this possible. Thank you, Dr. Kituyu. Kituyi. Um, I think the words that you have spoken today are profound. Um, I had a question in regards to what we, we, we saw and witnessed last week, which was the GES summit. How does that translate to the common Wananchi, to the Momamboga? How do we ensure that the investment, the international and the foreign investment, um, goes down to the very bottom and contributes value uh, to our community? Do we need to create a framework whereby foreign investors who come into the country um, invest or are now listed in the Nairobi Stock Exchange? Um, can I just add one quick point? Uh, David Drinkard was mentioning that at, at the GES summit, OTAG had a stand where you're creating a register um, for entrepreneurs and investors. I just thought that was quite, quite, quite pertinent. Can I take one more question before? Good morning. Thank you, Alikan, for having us here. My name is Brian from the University of Nairobi. Dr. why do you sound uh, that distant from Kenya? Are you not a Kenyan anymore? <laughs> your country, your president, and, 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 and such uh, statements. And also, personally, uh, what are you doing to try and catalyze, uh, now that you mentioned all these things that are wrong with our society and and politics. What, what are you doing on a personal level to try and catalyze us into a, a better direction? Thank you. Okay, let me just uh, talk to those uh, first. Uh, first, of uh, first of all, uh, the position I hold about uh, in, in entrepreneurs and investors, there's no country which succeeded with foreign investors without encouraging local investors. The best promotion for a country as a destination for foreign investors is what you do to those who are local entrepreneurs. So to my mind, what policies link enterprise to the people? It varies. One of the things we have been promoting is organic integration between invested enterprises and the, the areas where the populations are. Let me give an example. Many African countries, like you can go to Zambia, you find the railway line goes to the, coal, uh, the, 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 the copper mines and to the sea. And there is, it's like insulated from the rest of the economy, movement of uh, copper to China or to some other place, and no impact whatsoever apart from the rents that are given to the government. Now, there's a mining initiative that has been initiated by UNCTAD which has been adopted by African uh, mine ministers, which says that there should be a commitment that a certain percentage of rents from extractives must be specifically invested into the communities where the extraction goes. Secondly, my organization has joined a number of other international organizations on a campaign about fair taxation, meaning today, <coughs> Many countries investing from abroad make their profit in your country, but they declare the profit in the country where they're registered. This is mostly done in a low tax uh, regime countries, offshore registered headquarters. The purpose is to maximize profit, maximize profit. We are saying fair taxation should be that each country pays, each company pays the highest tax in the country where it makes its profit. So if most of your profits are from minerals in Mozambique, your highest taxation should be paid to Mozambique, not to the country where you are registered. Number three, it is the responsibility of governments to have a policy where you have a direct linkage, for example, in sub-services, that a, country, a company is investing into energy production. You should have a linkage with clear policy of what backup services have to be provided locally. You don't leave it to the discretion of a foreign investor. You can say, for example, if you're making uh, the pylons for power out of Turkana, a certain percentage has to be fabricated in, a, in, in a, what's this industrial area to the east of Nairobi? Yeah. Ali River. 
No, 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 no. There, there is an area near Gorokosha, not quite Gorokosha, but there's an area where they are very innovative. Kariobangi. That what can be made in by Kariobangi should not be imported from China. And you made it, make it standard government policy. So deliberate action increases local content in every investment activity. And then the spin-offs, the rest is the responsibility of government. You cannot ask the investor to start going to Mamamboga. It's how much government uses the proceeds of investment to shore up the social conditions, the market access conditions, the fairness of livelihood for the Mamamboga. What I have been complaining about is that the last weak link is partly because the resources that should improve the infrastructure for Mamamboga is being used to replicate a very expensive political class. The second question about distance. I am an international civil servant. The United Nations cannot have strong opinions on one side of government or another. I tell you things about the challenges you face exactly the way I did when I addressed the Paris, uh, Perez de Cuella, uh, Institute in Guatemala. I had an audience like this. I said what I thought were the challenges in Guatemala without trying to say this side is good, this side is bad. Your sense of me acting as a Kenyan, I've taken leave of that for the next eight years. <laughs> so I'm not being negative to Kenya. I think I make a substantial contribution when I mention that you have a capacity to do even better than you're doing. There's some things you're doing the right way. There's some things you could do a lot better. And if you think of it, the most important thing that Obama did for you is to tell you that you are able to play in another class from where you're playing today. It's an encouragement. Raise your ambitions. Abandon pettiness. Have a sense of genuine patriotism. When a policeman can release a terrorist because he's given a bribe, he lives in a different world from where we want to live. When a minister can cancel a contract because of rent seeking behavior, and the investor who had a clean contract goes to international investment dispute resolution mechanism, where Kenya is likely to pay more than $100 million fine for cancellation of a contract where the minister might have wanted 50 million shillings bribe, that person should not be the face of a Kenya that we want. That's the most I can do. If it sounds distant, let me be distant. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, my name is Andrew Franklin. You answered my question, which was mainly, do you feel that your perspective has been freed by getting out of here? See, because I remember your columns, and sometimes I would send you emails. Uh, we're much more circumspect and more uh, focused, I think. What the doctor has said is that after being here for 34 years, the missed opportunities, the constant snatching of the feet from the jaws of victory over and over again in this country is absolutely mind-boggling. The, uh, whether it's trying, whether you get shifted from uh, an employee of your own company to an investor, then you're told to sit at home for four and a half months while waiting for your work permit to be renewed, or going to the office of work. This is a mindset of people here. And the, the notion that politics gets in is true, but it's the politics of nothingness. There is, there, everyone's in favor of, of clean water, good health, education, and we get nowhere. We have a problem here, I think, that the KEPSA, the, the private sector here, for example, focuses on how many Pakistanis are selling used cars now. And on behalf of the Kenya Bazaar, we got to cut down those work permits. We can't compete when we sell new vehicles. We used to assemble vehicles here. We actually did a German car here in 87, unfortunately, in the world. It was an ASCA, $10,000, $11,000, done at General Motors. Where is it? The uh, thing is, we used to have all the industries to make wiring harnesses. All kinds of good things would go into our cars, and we could have built on that. South Africa today exports BMWs and Mercedes under a go. Uh, I mean, that's the kind. There, there are incredible contracts. And I think it's important when you're speaking to young people that we know where we've been, that we know that when I arrived in 81, the number one or two foreign exchange earner was refined petroleum products coming out of the refinery in Mombasa, going everywhere in this region. Now our refinery is closed. There are these things that it's not about being defensive or attacking the country, regardless of your skin color. 
there are things that are right and there are things that are wrong. And if you think something is wrong, you should say why it's wrong. Instead of saying, oh, go on. That I was reading, uh, one of my concerns is that most Kenyans seem to be losing trust in, in public sector. And we we think of how we can work with the private sector because you find a lot of donor funds come in. People are going through trips to, to spend taxpayers' money. So how can we strengthen the private sector? So that at least they can serve the people. Accessing uh, public sector is very difficult for many Kenyans. Number two, you have given us analysis of of the frustrations Kenya are facing in terms of there's, there's growth but there's no development. What, what is the way forward on this development? Again, given your position, international citizenship, I believe you are able to to inject some some sense in terms of policy development with the parliamentarians. I, I thought they would even be in such forum. I don't know why they should not be here. All right, uh, I've had you. I have you. Uh, the, the number of things. First of all, uh, it's um, I. I engage with a lot of leaders within the Kenya government, and I managed to tell them some of the things. When I shared with you my sense that I am leading an organization which is fighting for justice in investment dispute resolution, because most arbitration, 98% of awards are against governments in favor of investors. And when I saw uh, the cancellation of a petroleum prospecting license in Garissa, the cancellation of a clean contract of titanium in Kwale. I know Kenya taxpayers are going to pay a lot of money. And the reasons for this cancellation have nothing to do with public policy. It's just a politician with a large ego thinking he'll do it because he can do it. And it outraged me. And I told at the highest level, I've shared this with government, that this is not how to run a kindergarten. And something has to be done about this kind of behavior because it will hurt the taxpayer. But having said that, I am trying to engage you at what are the possibilities, what can be done, what, what does it take to have this a new, a new sense of purpose, how do we grow the new paradigm of who we are. There is a problem I've seen even in my life, in public life in Kenya, that uh, a lot of civil servants who are regulators of enterprise think they do favors to entrepreneurs, then they help them do business. But you think a businessman is like a leech, and you're just tolerating him. In 2005, I accompanied President Kibaki on a trip to Thailand. And I asked Prime Minister then, Taksin Senawat. In 1997, the economy of Thailand collapsed during that major crisis financial crisis of the time. But you've been able to turn it around. What is it that you did? He said, there are two things that you must always believe in. The first one is that entrepreneurs are the most important asset of any country. Your entrepreneurs are the most important asset to your country. But then, you should also believe that to water a wilting plant, you don't put water on the leaves, you put at the stem. So government intervention packages were targeted at the grassroots, to Mamamboga. But you always knew that when you avail money to the Mamamboga, the entrepreneur will collect all that money and use it as investable capital. By supplying services, they are very enterprising. So that linkage of state intervention at the grassroots with an enabling environment for the entrepreneur to use what goes to the grassroots to make difference is the critical challenge. It should never be an opposition between public and private. It's how do we sequence the regulator to be a facilitator, not an inhibition. I was telling an international conference that the miracle of Safaricom as m in Kenya was that you had for the first time in the world of finance a national financial regulator who was ready to facilitate what they did not understand its consequence properly. In most of our cases, what the public officer does not understand properly is illegal. But the story of m -Pesa was that regulators were ready to take a risk to facilitate something they did not properly understand. That mentality that enterprise is good for the country 
if it's not there, when entrepreneurs have to buy their licenses from regulators, you are not going anywhere. There are other countries which have tried that route and abandoned it. You are mature enough to abandon that route today. Thank you, Alkan uh, and Dr. Kitui. Those were very candid um, expressions. My name is Lynette Komboka and I'm the CEO of Data Science Limited. And assuming your eight years leave is done and from your experience you come back home and from an entrepreneur's point of view you wanted to start a business, offer solutions, what would you do? What opportunities do you see? Um, when we're talking about the political class, we do realize that there's still a lot of challenges, especially for the majority of the voters, uh, because most of them are not represented here. Really. So if we focused a lot more on business, if we focused a lot more on trying to do something that would help, that would you know, raise us from all these things, what opportunities do you see? What do you think would be worth doing to start changing the conversation? Thank you. My name is Mutabam Simi, and uh, I chair the budget. Appropriations <laughs> 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 It's lovely to see you. Uh, thanks, sir. I, I learned about this meeting an hour ago. Thank you for coming. So I just kind of dropped everything and came. Mm -hmm. and for everything that has happened in your personal life. I missed the presentation, <laughs> but I will take the liberty to perhaps ask. Uh, a, rest, a, a, a statement of a speech that you gave in, the, in, the, in Parliament when you came, I think it was last year. And uh, you, you took the view, if I remember correctly, that uh, we will not do very well as a country if we don't take the national platform seriously. We were involved with you in the struggle for a better Kenya. And as you spoke, I also understood you to be saying that you believed in devolution. So I don't think it was a put down in devolution. Would you find it in yourself, would, it, would you find it possible to just, even if it was outside of what you said this morning, because I think it's a very important statement, I, to just tell us, going forward, for our people who believe in devolution, with all the mess that's going on in the county governments, and it pains me personally, because I sign the bills, we pass them, we go to the president, they become law. And a third of the revenues that we collect is going to people who are misappropriating these funds. It, it is very, very difficult. Can you just perhaps just tell us what you, would, uh, what you are saying to the parliamentarians about the importance of national platform going forward? Secondly, um, we've just given uh, Kenya with 4.2 billion. <laughs> and, and I found myself asking this morning, in fact, I was telling my wife, I, I wonder what Bukisa would have done uh, if he was the Minister for Commerce and Trade, because we know what you did with Uchumi. I wonder what she would have done with Kenya. Thank you. Well, thank you. I uh, welcome my friend. I hadn't noticed you arrive. And, and, he is partly answered one question, partly what I was being asked. If I'm engaging uh, leaders in parliament, yes, I've been engaging Kenyan parliament. I've addressed the session of June session of Senate and the House uh, on some of the issues. Um, you asked me what I'll do. If I finish my international assignment, the first thing I'm looking forward to is improving my handicap in golf. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, but I think for persons who have had the privilege to serve in public office and with the high rec name recognition like myself, one of the main services they can offer this country is how to make government see that it is its business to facilitate business. This notion that the only business facilitated is what's owned by politicians is an anomaly. Government is supposed to be making Kenya a competitive destination for investment, where it's, you play by the rules, you are predictable, there's a low cost of transaction, there's a predictable relationship between what government promises and what delivers. We have been helping Kenya government as an organization with um, the development of electronic platform for, 
for governance. Uh, like uh, I'm working with the Kenya Investment Authority on uh, e-registration, and, 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 and we, we've been training senior officers in the Investment Authority on um, IT-based uh, management solutions, governance solutions, reducing the distance uh, between uh, entrepreneurs and regulators to avoid rent-seeking rent behavior. Uh, we are doing that also together with uh, Trademark uh, East Africa on um, transforming management at the ports and things like this. I think the main service I could support Kenya is to help mainstream the sense that government is about facilitating enterprise Kenya and investing in the human resource of Kenya. To me, those are the, the segment that I could see as really something I can say about. Mwishmiwa Mutaba Msemi, you may ask me to recap uh, uh, a, a statement I've made. I've made reference to something close to it today about unsustainable cost of a proliferating political bureaucracy. That when you have uh, councillors, now you call them something else, and they move from 12,000 shillings to 300,000 shillings a month, the taxpayer cannot afford to sustain this phenomenal expansion. When you have increased members of parliament, when I went to parliament in 1992, my takeaway salary was 19,000 shillings. Today, they are approaching 1.5 million shillings. You don't have the moral authority to tell teachers what you are asking for is unsustainable if you are sustaining this for yourself. But I've not yet come to the main issue, which is uh, how, what, can, what can we do? I support devolution. I have always done. And history will mark it out that when there was a standoff about whether devolution should be provinces or to constituencies, it is me who recommended that we create a new entity called the county to be the locus of devolved government. But when I recommended that, I wanted Kenya to be divided in about 20 to 25 counties. But in Naivasha, nobody had trust in Andrew Legale's commission to now start carving the country into 25 units. Then they say, let us go to the districts of 1992 as the counties. I believe in devolution, but I have two problems about the form of implementation. One, giving the discretion to create positions, uh, governance advisor, political advisor, governance <laughs> consultant on this, uh, different you know, jobs for the boys with phenomenally large payment behind them. When you have illegal appropriation of public resources, you know how f devolution failed in Uganda? Devolved units could not pa manage public finances properly and the authority to manage those resources were recentralized to the treasury. And if you follow the law as even based on the constitution of Kenya today, you are able to stifle up to half of all the counties in Kenya because of illegal appropriation of public resources. It demonstrated inability to follow the law in utilizing public resources. So there's one side about that, but that's not my main, the, the primary concern for me. The primary concern is enterprise Kenya needs predictable, clear rules for an investor. But when you have a situation that I negotiate with the Kenya government a contract, I'm going to build a coal mine in Mwingi. And then the politicians from Mwingi put together a team of councillors to visit my country to do due diligence of my mining competence. What diligence does a councillor know about the equipment for mining coal? <laughs> when we agree with government about rents on investment, and tomorrow the county government imposes a new rent to the investor, who will keep the word of Kenya to the investor? So to me, devolution has to have clear tracks about one, not adding to the cost of enterprise. And Kenya in its organs of integration in its African common market has committed that to the no additional taxation or actions of equivalent uh, uh, consequence shall be imposed on an enterprise passing through Kenya. 
what is the reality today? You are from Uganda, you are importing something through Kenya. You come to Timboroa and you find a man in a bright yellow ugly jacket, overcoat, <laughs> with a chain across the road. He extorts and gives you a receipt on behalf of the local council. This is contravention of the principle and word of the organs of this Afghan integration. So government should discuss clearly about how to relate the revenue needs of county devolved government and national government and preferably let there be one collection point to ease movement of goods to keep the word that an investor sees one Kenya. Secondly, and more importantly to me, we have all been saying counties are the locus of development. There is certain development that cannot be done at county level. National government matters if you are going to be a big player. If Kenya is going to be the driver of infrastructure integration between Douala and Lamu, that's not going to be done by Tumami, the governor of Lamu. It's going to be driven by Nairobi. If government is going to create the infrastructure for competitive educated product, build a center of excellence in innovative technology, and get the brightest girls and boys of Kenya to go to that institution for the next level of innovation, that's not going to be done by any county government. That is going to be done by national government. Today, you cannot sustain innovativeness without substantial resources put into R&D. Governments are putting resources in research and development. I said you are not even removing the space for hair pieces in IHUB, <laughs> let alone putting resources into innovative research. Today, Google and Microsoft are doing more in, 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 in making young men and women at the IHUB see what is happening than the government of Kenya. That's a reality. The resourcefulness, the purposefulness, the targeting of those resources for the national elite, the national product that will do us proud, is muffled when we think that development is sending money to the counties for them to announce how many ambulances they have bought. So let us be clear about balancing between county government but retaining a single Kenya for regulation of investment. You can agree about what percentage that is collected by the national government goes to a county government, but remove a situation where councillors are confronting an investor and saying, you will get out of here unless you give a certain percentage of your investment. That is conduct and becoming for our country aspiring to be the leader of Africa. But most importantly, national development beyond what can be done at the grassroots remains a responsibility and should become again a responsibility of national government. About Kenya Airways. I've been very reluctant to talk about Kenya Airways. <laughs> I did mention some things about Kenya Airways here. Yeah. My sense is that um, I already wrote an open letter some time ago to my friend Naikuni asking him that time was up, he should have left. Uh, but I didn't think it was right to live by uh, with uh, an expensive purchase of, uh, of, of, of planes. First of all, most airlines, and Kenya Airlines have done it in the past, that you might have a 10-year rollout program, but you do not overwhelmingly stack up front the capital cost purchasing expensive planes at a go. A basket, a blend of leases and staggering the acquisition with the growing capacity have always been important. To a happy enterprise is reflected by the mood of the people who work for the enterprise. The conduct, the management of interpersonal skills, the human relations in Kenya was, for some time has been very bad. That when pilots say that they want something else, you start threatening with wet leases that you're going to be hiring foreign pilots to do their job. It has been tried in Europe, it has failed. Even Lufthansa attempted that one of the ways to lower the cost of uh, pilots is to use the pilots who have recruited for the subsidiary smaller carrier as the main standard ones that go to the main carrier because they have cheaper contracts. It didn't work. But when you see a society taking to court trade unionists who are agitating against what the government is doing, you know that this is not management on the right footing. Those are issues to be sorted at one level. At another level, the principal stakeholders in Kenya, particularly shareholders, include the Kenya government and KLM, 
and the substantial shareholders locally must find resources to return the, the, the Kenya Airways into profitability. There's the massive capital injection requirements beyond the four billion you have put in have to be raised. Kenya cannot afford to let Kenya Airways slip away. It's critical, not just for national profile, but the service sector where you celebrate your strength on transport. Tourism, hot culture, they are so deeply in, in, in integrated and related to the survival and prosperity of Kenya Airways that it absolutely must be found a way to, to deal with this properly. Um, there are challenges. Some challenges are external. Uh, the aggressive subsidized uh, airlines from the Middle East, uh, the new aggressiveness of Turkish airlines, and the weakness of African governments which allow Middle East airlines to stop in more than one destination on one route, which is not an obligation under IATA. When Kenya Airways is going to Turkey, it has been allowed to stop in Cairo, but it may drop passengers in Cairo, but it can never pick passengers in Cairo to take to Turkey. Yet you have airlines from the Middle East which hop around this continent picking people at different places, which means directly competing with local airlines without a reciprocal possibility from the Middle East for Eastern African airlines, for African airlines. So these are some challenges, some issues have to be dealt with. Um, it's difficult, it's very complex, but Kenya Airways must survive and rise again. Mr. Togo? Uh, by the, this is a very good friend of mine from Kinshasa who came in this morning. Uh, thank you very much, Ali uh, Thank you, Dr. Uh, my name is Elvi Gogo, uh, an African who happened to be born in uh, the Ivory Coast. Uh, I'm an international lawyer and a UN staff in uh, Congo. So I have to put a disclaimer before starting that. You know that, that everything I will be saying here is my own. Thank you. Now, I just wanted to say to my fellow Kenyans that as much as they are proud of uh, Dr. Mutisa Kitui, we Africans are also proud. I met, in fact, Dr. Kitui, but I will put my question, but you will accept that coming from Kinshasa. I have uh, to make a statement. <laughs> and I travel with, actually, uh, with Kenya Airways. I don't know whether I was the one who made the stewardess uh, smile, but still there was some smile, so I'm <laughs> for the future of Kenya Airways. So, no, I, I met actually uh, uh, Dr. Kitui in Arusha, where I was a lawyer at the International uh, Criminal Court for Rwanda. And I met him because I had a fellow Kenyan who told me that, guys, you like reading books? Come. We are meeting uh, Dr. Kitu, and you will see. And uh, it's, it's sharp. Sharp. And uh, as an international lawyer, I know very much that uh, uh, the succession at the WTU, not the UNTAD, uh, when Pascal Lamy was, a term was ending, I could tell you that uh, Mukisa Kitu was the one to, to become the Secretary General not of the UNTAD, but the most prominent WTO. But African politics and diplomacy failed, completely failed. So uh, I'm very proud, and uh, you deserve what you you are today. And I was very, as much I was proud, I was also uh, at the political level when I saw the list of the Grand Coalition and Dr. Kitui was no longer there. I said, that's Africa. <laughs> yes. That's Africa. I came from. Uh, I come from a country uh, under Ufot Boyi, our first president, and I did all my degree in Ivory in the Ivory Coast. I just went later on uh, uh, to uh, complete a postgraduate degree at the university in Frankfurt. But I did all my study and I started working as a judge in my country. And we really need strong institutions, and my country is the model of a failed state in Africa who expanded, no, seriously, we have everything in, in the Ivory Coast. If there was people in Africa who would not be interested in traveling abroad, it was in my country. I'm, I'm living today in, in Congo and uh, in the DRC, and by the way, it's true what he said about the DRC. Go to Kinshasa, you will see the growth. 
but you will not see any development. That's a curse for Africa. So I really think that time has come for us really to look in the governance. We need governance. If the, uh, the county government are still plunging that's money of Kenyan taxpayers. Just expect the Kenya shilling for 200 buck to the dollars. I think it doesn't, in, in the world of economics, I'm not an economist, Ali Khan is better than me, but I think you cannot improvise and expect better. So, uh, Professor Kitu, my question is about uh, subsidies. You know that that is, uh, for me, an injustice in, in international trade. As much as uh, many uh, Western countries want the space for sp uh, services widely open, they are still keeping the uh, subsidies on agriculture, agriculture as intact. What is what you are, uh, uh, your organization is doing really to address uh, that uh, injustice? And I hope that uh, the Doha next uh, uh, round of discussion will allow you to really strike a deal on that and to have really the subsidies that is applied by America and Europe cut. Thank you very much. Dr. I would agree, we were in this same, same room when some investor cried that he had invested 10 billion into that city and he was to invest 100 billion Kenya shillings and he was having issues. I, so we understand what you're saying. But my question is a little bit sensitive. I met a certain professor from Nigeria who was teaching in Namibia, and we had a discussion. And uh, after some discussion, I happened to have gone through the path of these people who are quasi trained, what, do they, what are they called, to provide legal, very basic legal services? Paralegal. Paralegals. Now, and he, after engagement with him, he told me, but why have you not moved on to become a lawyer? And I said, oh, here in Kenya there is no path, you know, of credit transfer. And he said, this is something I've experienced with black people over the world. He said that, and he's a professor, by the way. So the discourse about our blackness, don't you think it's a discussion that we should have? Because the worst <laughs> country in the Western Hemisphere is Haiti, which is black. And then I, I was at the higher, I have just last week when uh, Facebook came with their internet.org and uh, they, they deliberately brought some black facilitators from the US. And uh, the, one of them, after giving his presentation, said, wow, I'm overwhelmed that I'm in a company of black entrepreneurs. It's great. <laughs> and then you look at us as black people and the, our capacity to handle politics. You were in politics. I followed you from right 1991, 92 there. I followed the Reverend here, Mukisa Kitui. You in politics is the antithesis of you who is speaking now. And I can demonstrate. So here is Mukisa Kitui. When we are given political power, we become, we become malevolent. Mukisa Kitui is standing up and saying, justify. No, no not Mutawa Muslim, it is Mukisa Kitui himself. Who said it? Three occasions which I can demonstrate. Mm. This is the referendum of 2007. So we were, we were mobilizing when you we were being appointed to the UNTA to try and say something, but then better judgment prevailed. You said that uh, how do you go and attack a police station and then people come, and that was Uhuru Park, and you expect policemen to come and waving flowers. And this was an instance where policemen had gunned down people. I hope you remember. <laughs> clips, clips, I think. Are then you say also that monopoly of bad manners is, does not belong to one community. Mm. So, very, very malevolent statement. Then you say, somewhere in Bungoma, during the referendum, that I have heard that a word in, in Bukusu, which was translated was as cockroaches. Then Mukisa Kitu is here, Dr. Mutawa Musimi is here, Reverend Dr. Mutawa Musimi, whom we follow during the NCC and all those things. And now, he is a jubilee hall, which is not bad, but the things he represents, surely, are antithetical to those benevolent, you know, aspirations. So where is the disconnect? Okay. The black discourse. Don't you think it's time we sat down and had a black discourse?
All right, uh, I will take those three first before we go to the next one. Agricultural subsidies. Um, last week, Monday, I had a meeting with Africa Trade Ministers in Nairobi. And the two things that I've been saying to them was the first and most important. The Doha round has been sluggish for the past 13 years. One of the consequences is the key players have been moving away from the multilateral rule-making system to mega plurilaterals. The Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, TTIP, and Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP. The consequence is developmental issues are voided, removed from the main theme of trade liberalization uh, agreements. Secondly, the fetish about intellectual property over manufacturing because the most industrious countries are not competitive as manufacturers. As they externalize manufacturing, they add a premium to intellectual property like the patent rights. So that, for example, you get an iPhone. It is made in China with components from Vietnam and South Korea, but it has an Apple sign on it. And you have Apple company taking away half of the value of the sold iPhone, which is actually not made by Apple. Apple. So the discussion about be protecting and growing intellectual property rights is an issue that has to be discussed. Similarly, the developmental questions are mostly for the poor who are not sitting at the table with the Transatlantic and Trans-Pacific. So my argument has been, it is important for Africa that the Doha round is brought to an end. Let us start a Nairobi round, which inherits the unfinished questions of agricultural subsidy but starts addressing questions of digital inclusion, questions of uh, uh, who owns the cloud in computing, and what, uh, how do we have share access to cloud computing resources. Questions of, uh, for example, as we grow global value chains, that products are now being made from different countries, that's an international distribution of tasks, more than manufacturing of a, a one country, how do we allocate fairly value to the different components of the value chains? These are issues that should now come into an Nairobi round that starts in Nairobi this December for the next few years. That if it doesn't work, WTO and the multilateral rule making stands a risk of becoming irrelevant as plurilaterals become important. But that doesn't excuse those who are continuing to hide in inefficient agriculture behind tar high tariffs. Europe, with domestic subsidy, and America. But unfortunately, you cannot get past the French farmers. Politically, you cannot make the French drop subsidies to agriculture. And you cannot get America to commit to reducing agricultural subsidies in an election year. So these are realities that we have to live with. Now, the gentleman here was just the third one now. I was talking about attacking a police station. <laughs> Even today, if I visited you and you asked my opinion, I think it's foolhardy for anybody to attack a police station. It's not whether I was in government or not, I still think there are some things you don't do. It's harakiri. Don't attack a police station. You don't do it in the USA. In the name of democracy. It's foolhardy. So it's not a malevolent position. I don't remember that I ever said it, but if you ask me, I will still tell you today. You may have a lot of disagreements, but don't ever be so stupid as to attack a police station. It should never happen. Uh, similarly, I could still hold that no section of society has a monopoly over bad manners. In the sense that you cannot always continue perpetuating a sense of outrage as you have seen the Quanon. That others are held in restraint and like you are forgiven, you can continue having bad manners forever. There are challenges to a society. How can we grow civility in the way we deal with issues? We have collective challenges. Outrage is some form of doing it. But the culture of modernization also has some phenomenon, that every country has to have a cultural phenomenon in the way it grows its sense of self-discourse. Kenya will have to reach a point where qualitatively to transform from a poor country into a middle-income country with the attendant prestige, you also decline the culture of bad manners, that we cannot celebrate bad behavior, that uh, 
the, 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 the role model is not the Matatu Manamba who is touching women in private parts in public and smiling about it. That you start being outraged about such behavior. It's just a cultural uh, growth that is expected of a country. That uh, to stand, to jump a queue is not acceptable conduct in public. That these are little things that grow as part of cultural renewal of a society. About uh, black identity, there is, there is an issue. You know, Professor Goebel, the, the Minister of Propaganda of Hitler, said when a lie is repeated many times, it becomes a truth. When a black person is told very many times that the inhibition to your progress is being black, they start believing in it, like they have racial impediment to progress. But when you make choices that are wrong, they are not choices you have made because you are black. You are just a black person who has made wrong choices. <laughs> I have a friend who has been the most successful president of the Dominican Republic and is the only black man who was president of the Dominican Republic, Leonel Fernandez. His blackness did not inhibit him. Earlier this year, I visited the president of uh, Costa Rica and at a state lunch on he hosted for me, he was serving us with plantain and cassava and he said, I'm celebrating my black Jamaican mother by offering the first African meal in State House in the history of Costa Rica. I don't think that his black blood was in inhibition. The reality is that you have a lot of black people who are very, very good engineers, innovators, managers around the world. For some of them, they are starved of company of brilliant, rising black faces. When they come to the IHUB and they see young entrepreneurs who are black, they feel inspired the confirmation that they are not unique in their goodness, that out there there are other persons who look like them who are also equally enterprising. But we many times stifle them. We don't stifle them because they are black. We stifle them because we have lost our ways about what we want to do. So to me, the sense of associating blackness, the race with the negatives, is, is absolutely wrong. Some of the most progressive leaders in any state in the U.S., I have to be found in Georgia, and the leaders of uh, drivers of enterprise in Georgia. If you go to Atlanta, you will find a lot of them are black persons. So it's a, it, it, there's a dislink between the myth of blackness and failure, because you just make wrong choices. A lot of black white people make right, wrong choices, and, and and fail just the same as uh, black people make wrong choices and fail. Recently, one of the largest banks in Switzerland, which makes it one of the largest banks in the world. Uh, Credit Suisse in a crisis because of poor management by a fantastically educated German Swiss fired the CEO and appointed as a new international president with one of the largest banks in the world a black man from Ivory Coast yes they did not think that uh, in a crisis in one of the biggest banks in the world how can you put a black person no they found a talent whose race did not matter, and is performing, is standing around one of the biggest banks in the world. Uh, thanks, Anka, for organizing such an event. Uh, we always live uh, one step right Thank you. yesterday. And I also thank you for the, the nice, insightful talk that you gave us. Uh, my question is uh, concerning the former, uh, the informal sector, the Juakali, that uh, long ago, during Baki's regime, when he got into power in 2002, he spoke about empowering that sector, which was uh, to be the driving force of uh, manufacturing in Kenya. But nowadays, I think we've shifted to, to something else. Uh, I've not heard anything about the Jokali since uh, the new regime came in, and there's been more destruction to Nikomba market, to some other places like uh, the Grogon uh, people over there without any substantial uh, support for them to at least provide them the you know, yeah, the enabling environment for them to grow so that they can be your future manufacturers. Uh, I think also on that retrospect, uh, we say that 20%, I think it's a 20% of our, our elite are living in Nairobi and the bulk people who contribute to our economy 
are those informal sector? You hear comments on that please. Uh, uh, first of all, I don't think that uh, the informal sector is the largest co contributor, except for employment. Uh, for value, it's uh, slightly different. They are very significant source of employment and uh, livelihoods. In many countries, there are a number of policies that you deal with as a way of uh, reaching out to the informal sector. It is not the engine of uh, technological innovation, but it's a major con consumer of technology. So, many times the governments in developing countries see the informal sector as a threat, as a problem with law and order. But the reality is that it is a major source of incomes and livelihoods for a lot of families. What can be done? A number of things. First of all, reduce the cost of becoming formal. If you are in Kikomba, and you made some, uh, some cans for irrigating uh, small plots and you employ nine people. You don't pay any income, you know, you know, any co corporate tax. You don't have city council inspections uh, certificate. You have no environmental inspection issues. You don't need to have a tax address. The moment you employ employee number 10, the city council rates you for a health certificate, for an environmental inspection, for, uh, the, the central government asks you for your tax number, your PIN. Compliance requires that you employ another two people who have to follow the different papers. So reducing the hostility of becoming formal will encourage companies which otherwise now register a second company with nine employees so as to remain informal instead of employing three people and saving the money of buying more space. So formalization at low cost will make them pay taxes, but it becomes attractive. It is also accompanied by public services. Number two, a clear policy linking innovation and innovative centers like business incubators with the work in the informal sector is a major way of getting places like uh, the, the, the industrial area we talked about, they make portion mills and, uh, and, 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 and other enterprises into major production areas. It is not all lost. In this country, increasingly, in spite of inadequate public support, the informal sector in some areas has been able to be innovative. But one word doesn't like is a replication that when the first person starts making uh, wheelbarrows, everybody else wants to make wheelbarrows. <laughs> uh, the, the need to have you know, uh, the diversification in the product and public support for an environment, infrastructure, will be able to grow the potential of this informal sector to deal with the anomaly of growth without employment. Yes, uh, good, uh, good morning and thank you, uh, Ali. I like that striking feature. Huh? More in the mental sense of things. Dr. Kituri, thank you very much. Um, I have just two short questions and a comment. The first one is uh, on the issue of the service sector, which Dr. Kituri has talked about. Maybe you may not give us an answer, but you may indicate how we can go about developing the, the right policy, on, especially considering the role the service sector contributes. And then the second one is something we've uh, talked about on fair taxation, which is the same topic that uh, the chair of the African Union, uh, uh, Mrs. Zuma, mentioned to Obama in uh, at Sabah, especially on the issue of uh, multinational corporations and how they get money out of Africa. It seems that is a topic that when we were studying economics in university, we were talking about it, and it's still the practice is still there. That it doesn't seem to have been much, uh, uh, much improvement on that. Now, on a, on a comment, since the, the, the audience is fairly young, which is very good, what I would like to, to, to comment from the two hosts we have here in front of us, it's about personal branding. Dr. Kitui is somebody I've known for 50 years and uh, he has always strived to 
develop himself as a brand. And today, where he is, is because he has seen himself as an international brand, which Ali here has also built himself as a brand. We had lunch last week with a Kenyan who moved to Canada two and a half years ago. And in these two and a half years ago in Canada, she branded herself. She had done all kinds of things in Kenya. It's somebody you know. In Canada, she was approached to do an advert for a leading American car manufacturer, exclusive car manufacturer. And because of the brand she had built for herself, they had to go through her lawyers who were in London to negotiate the rate for her. A very, in fact, the largest um, advert payment anybody can get. So what I would say to you as young people, part of what you can draw out from uh, what Dr. Kitui has talked about is that sometimes we got carried away and say we're Kenyans, we're from this tribe, we're from this region, we're this and that, and we undermine all that human capital that Kenya has. But the moment you begin to see, I spent most of my year working outside the country. I was celebrated, not as an African, but as a professional. In fact, it was Dr. Kitui who fished me out there and said, why don't you do what you're doing out there and come back here? And I was the youngest uh, chairman of ICDC. I've already finished that. And a lot of it is to do with personal branding. So don't view yourself as a, just another Kenyan from Nairobi University and so forth, but build your brand. And you'll reach what Dr. Kitui has reached. Thank you very much. My name is Charles Wafula and I've got uh, three quick questions. One is to unpack and uh, sort of reverse on the Mutawa Msimi's question about KQ. Uh, what's uh, your view about government bailouts channeled towards insolvent and uh, unprofitable bank startups? Generally, a couple of them have happened and just wanted to get a sense about that. Uh, number two, um, listening to you, I got the sense that politics and development are sort of like Siamese twins. And, and for Kenya, it seems like development moves as fast as its lowest political choice. And uh, so what I wanted to get from you is how do we as Kenyans, and having been a practitioner, how do we um, free ourselves from that chokehold of, of rich progressive politics? And finally, um, I mean, listening to you, I don't think anyone can get enough of you. I wonder when your autobiography hits the bookstores. Thanks. <laughs> My name is Beatrice. My question is actually a follow-up with regards to where Africa sits at the global table because we find that either African leaders are not lobbying enough for their own to be at the table, for instance at WTO when you were trying to aspire for that. Is it that we're not lobbying enough, and I'm sure it's not lack of merit, that the merit we have is talking about human capital. What do we need to do as a continent to actually transcend and to be this global board, so to speak, in order for the African voice to be heard, because there's a disconnect and it's an irony. <laughs> no, I, I, want, I want to thank you for the brutal analysis that you <laughs> it, it has to be that brutal. Following up on that one, I always worry when you are talking about our development, our failures, our capacities, you talk about, about our intelligentsia, which seems to achieve outside Kenya cannot develop Kenya, cannot develop Africa. You are actually talking about leadership. You are saying our leadership cannot take us there so far. The political leadership that we have elected and will continue to elect mediocres on tribal basis because I must elect my tribe. Yeah? And I, when I think about it all, because it has to be that leadership that must deliver us. And the leadership, we have increased the numbers now, uh, but bigger burden. What will protect us from this leadership? Or, put it in another way, how can we get Kenyans to supervise their leadership so that they don't spend all our money benchmarking, going for trips, and eating it here when they are not out there. How 
Because we really have to be, it has to be us. And I was wondering, is this why Obama is seeming to pay uh, more attention to civil society, the kind of training them more than, and then telling us all the politicians are the same. Now, how, how can we get there? How can we get good leadership? Is this a cultural change which may take us 50 years? What is it? What can we do to get our leaders? First of all, to elect right. Electing right you can forget because it has been tried maybe for the next 30 years. But getting them to do what is good for Kenya because I wonder whether there is anyone elected who sought office to deliver Kenya. Okay, um, let, let me just uh, start by talking to that. I, uh, I have no answer for you. <laughs> Choices have consequences. You cannot sow wheat and harvest wheat. What you do is you take leave of your rational collective sense of where you want to go. I'm not holding you a person responsible. But the average Kenyan voter votes for a person who pays most money in bribes. <laughs> regardless of the source of that money, regardless of the quality of person, the moral character, intellectual development, anything. They just, you can have the most stupid idiot with the largest bag of money, you elect him for anything he wants. <laughs> then after election, the rest of you take over and decide the money of that person to perform as if he's not what he is. You cannot get out of leaders characteristics that were not in them when you elected them. So there has to be a causal relationship between the choice of who is my leader and the expectation of what they can deliver. Now if you create a dealing between those every two months before an election and then you regain them, you will continue being grumpy, excited for the election period, grumpy for the next five years, excited again in those cycles, and they're not going anywhere. The world is not waiting. Even in this region, don't think that your preeminence is a God-given, that is a granted phenomenon. Today, as we talk, Ethiopia has sustained GDP growth of more than 10% for 10 years. That's phenomenal performance, only outdone by China. Today, Ethiopia is assembling more than 60% of all mobile handsets made in Africa. In two years, Ethiopia will account for 80% of all shoes made in Africa. Poor Ethiopia without a middle class. Many years of military dictatorship, autocratic rule, is attracting international attention. Ten years ago, Nairobi was the diplomatic headquarters of Africa. UN agencies, which were not based in Kenya, had their Africa offices in Nairobi. Today, last week Wednesday, I opened my Africa office in Addis Ababa. UNDP Africa office, which was in Nairobi, relocated to Addis Ababa. Obama comes to talk to Kenya in Nairobi and goes to talk to Africa in Addis Ababa. You must see the shift of gravitas. Ethiopian airline has become the largest and most successful airline in Africa. As you struggle with Kenya Airways, the price is being passed on. The question of using public money to subsidize, to raise, uh, uh, struggling, not even parastatals. We're not even talking about what we're talking about quoted private companies. The largest single expenditure of President Obama in America was to bail out private banks. Enterprise Kenya is a business of Kenya. There is so much riding on the back of Kenya Airways that it is public responsibility that Kenya Airways must be saved and grow. So trying to follow a notion is that this public money going after bad thing. It is not true. That is a propaganda that neoliberals peddle, but there is no historical evidence that it makes sense. Most countries identify national priorities and put public resources in helping what's important for the country. And that is the direction all go. And that's why I'm proud when I managed to raise 870 million shillings to save Uchumi. 
it was a quoted company, but I felt pride. And uh, when I write my story, it will be there. It will have its pride of place. About lobbying, um, first of all, sorry, let me just go back to something which was mentioned, including uh, what Kent uh, Libiso said. It is true that uh, I persuaded Kent to leave his job in Finland to come here and become a chairman of ICDC, and I never regretted that decision. Um, about the self, part of uh, the reason I accepted to come to this function today is I'm talking to persons who represent the face of emergent Kenya, the right Kenya, the Kenya that I hope cannot repeat the mistakes of my generation of political leaders. And that Kenya has to believe in itself. Trust that regardless of where you came from, you have the resilience, you have the capacity to strive to realize your dreams. Two weeks ago, I was at my daughter's graduation in Sussex, and the, ch the chancellor of the University of Sussex said, nobody can succeed in insulting you unless you decide that his words are an insult to you. <laughs> in my mother, if somebody, in my mother tongue, if somebody tells you your mother, you start losing your head because I've been insulted. But if to you I say your mother, say, but what's the matter with my mother? And if you don't take that as an insult, you can't get insulted. It's just uh, the same with inferiority. Nobody can make you feel inferior without your permission. Yes. You live in a biased world with a lot of challenges. Many of you do not have to surmount challenges more than I surmounted growing up. My earliest collection as a human being goes back to 1961. And our home had been overrun by Sabaot raiders who came and burnt house that night. And we were taken to walk five kilometers to go and live in the closest house which had iron ships, that it could not be burnt at night. And I remember my father going out you know, to collect household things and hide in the bush. My earliest recollection as a human being. I've come from that life walked through a difficult education journey, including being expelled by Moi from university when I was in my final year, being detained because I spoke Swahili in Uganda that I might be an agent of uh, Tanzania, being taken to military barracks where we were locked up with Otieno Kajwang and Rumba Kinudia in a room with skulls, shattered skulls of people who had been killed in police custody. I finished my first degree as a refugee on a UNI Commission of Refugees scholarship. It has been a slightly longer and more complicated route than yourselves, many of you. But I get satisfaction when other persons don't have to go through that trauma. But that trauma tells you that if you have self-believe and you, you are determined and you believe in yourself, the travails of the journey need not curtail you reaching the destination near to person. What Obama did for you last week is to tell you, you are capable, yes you can. The most that others can do for you is to encourage you, have trust, be consistent between your actions and your goals. The most important personal advice I received as a politician was from the late John Michuki, who told me, Kitui, you have a future. But I want to tell you just one thing. I learned the hard way that the best way to prepare for the next job is to do the current job as well as possible. I had the privilege to serve as trade minister. Those who knew what it entails, particularly international trade, know that I put in my best effort. To the extent that it earned me support from many different persons, including the one person who presented my name as a candidate for the UNCTAD position who is the president of Rwanda. And after two years, I think I haven't disappointed those who trusted in me by what I've been able to do in expanding the reach of my organization, opening, expanding, revamping offices in New York, opening for the first time offices in Addis, 
growing new programs, including now what I've just launched with support of the Chinese government, cabinet training for some governments across the continent. I want you to believe in yourself. You will not live my life. You will never take away from me the fact that I have the privilege to be the first Kenyan under Secretary General of the United Nations. You might be second, but just believe that you are capable of doing it. <laughs> Yeah, but um, you choose your different routes, but b nobody can give you the self-confidence. We can encourage you, but that talent in you is what makes this a, a place with so much potential. And I believe if you nurture it, if you go beyond tribe, if you go beyond over believing in politics as the panacea of all problems, uh, there's a future for this country. Thank you. I would, I would like to really thank Dr. Petunia for what was a very open, frank discussion. I think you've, you've tapped into a lot of issues there. I think we can keep you here all day, but we know you've got to play some golf. <laughs> Dr. Petunia, that was brilliant, as I expected. And I'm really grateful that you took time in a difficult moment to come and speak to us. Thank you, sir.